Now it's time to talk about web security basics. Usually when we think about web security, we think about HTTPS and TLS encryption, but that's only the first layer of defense that we have to protect our web server and its data. We need to make sure that the application is secure, that whatever website is running on our server doesn't have any bugs or security problems with it. We need to make sure that the server itself is up to date on all of its security updates. We need to limit access to our web server to make sure that no one can connect to it in a way that they shouldn't be allowed to. And I think the piece that often gets underemphasized is just that attention to detail is the biggest thing we can do to, to protect our server and our server environment. All websites do need HTTPS these days. HTTPS helps secure information in three basic ways, authentication, data integrity, and encryption. Authentication means you're communicating with who you think you are. Data integrity means that you're communicating in the way that you intended to. And encryption means that the data is being transferred in a format that only the intended recipient can understand. In order for your browser to trust an HTTPS certificate, it must be verified by a trusted certificate authority. These are companies and organizations that issue certificates around the world and the certificate authority certificate is included in your browser. So that's how your browser knows which certificates it can trust. And if it finds a certificate that isn't signed properly by one of these certificate authorities, then it's going to say it's an invalid certificate. Now, one of the nice things about having all of these packages signed by these certificates is not only does the signature verify who the certificate is from, but it also verifies that the data was transferred correctly because it signs the data in a way that makes sure that when that data gets unpacked, it matches the signature and everything is good. So the this whole process improves data integrity too and makes sure that you didn't lose any packets along the way. And finally, the whole transaction is encrypted, so nothing can open it except for the browser that requested it. Back in 2010, in the early days of Wi-Fi hotspots cropping up kind of everywhere, someone came up with a browser extension called FireSheep. Now, the way that FireSheep worked is it would sniff all of the Wi-Fi traffic around it. And because that traffic was not encrypted, it could sniff out all of the traffic going by, including the cookies that were being passed back and forth. And users who were logged into Facebook and Twitter with cookies set to indicate that they were logged in, those cookies had enough information that the browser with FireSheep installed, the snooping browser, could actually grab those cookies and start impersonating that session. And all of a sudden, the person who was snooping was logged into Facebook or Twitter with the cookies that had been stolen. And so that's a big problem. And then also, you know, websites, content management systems, anything like that, those were all suddenly vulnerable too, and people could get into those sites. And so there was a lot of hacking going on that wasn't even really hacking. All you had to do was sit in a coffee shop, passively stealing all of the traffic around you. So according to the Google security blog in February of 2018, a secure web is here to stay. And at that point, Google announced that beginning in July of 2018, with the release of Chrome 68, Chrome will mark all HTTP sites as not secure. So all sites will have to be HTTPS or be marked insecure. And as has happened in the past, Chrome has led the way with things like this and other browsers like Mozilla Firefox follow pretty quickly behind. Uh, the Microsoft browsers, of course, IE 11 will probably never get that kind of an update. Microsoft Edge may start doing something similar soon. But definitely with the market share that Chrome now has, it's very, very likely that um, HTTP will pretty much have to go away in, in the very near future because all of those sites are going to be marked insecure. Now, HTTPS was created in 1994 by Netscape Communications for the Navigator browser. It originally used SSL or Secure Sockets layer to encrypt connections. However, SSL has always had inherent security flaws, 
starting with version 1.0, which was never even released for public use because it was so bad. And over time, SSL 2.0 was deemed unusable. And by 2015, SSL 3 was also deemed unusable. Fortunately, by that point, we already had transport layer security, which is the new protocol that's being used to encrypt all communications over HTTPS. Now, there are some problems with security in TLS as well. And due to those limitations, TLS 1.0 should really be phased out by the end of June 2018. And in mid-2018, TLS 1.2 is the current recommended version for use. In March of 2018, TLS 1.3 became an internet draft standard, and many security experts are recommending switching to it as soon as possible, even though most platforms don't yet support it. One other thing that can be added on to HTTPS is the HTTP strict transport security. HSTS protects websites from downgrading. In other words, um, there are things that can sometimes force a site to downgrade from TLS to SSL. And in fact, that capability is one of the reasons that TLS 1.0 is no longer in use. But then there can be mistakes, just bad links in a website or, or bad design decisions that could take someone from an HTTPS back down to HTTP. And what HSTS does is it says that once an HTTPS connection is established, it tells the browser that for a certain amount of time, it should never drop back to HTTP. And the default value that's recommended when setting this up is one year. So basically, once you have ever connected to a site using HTTPS that has this turned on, you should never drop back again. In our labs, when we added HTTPS to our Linux websites in particular, we set up redirects to make sure that um, to make sure that those sites redirected from port 80 to port 443. But HSTS works even better because it just tells the browser never drop back to HTTP again, or at least for the length of that session. It should be set to hold a browser to HTTPS for at least as long as the session is valid. Now, there are some things that can allow for bypassing of HSTS, including the fact that the client can just choose to ignore it. Um, but it's definitely a help and helps to make things more secure. And I believe you have to have HSTS set in order to receive an A plus rating from SSL Labs if you check your encryption there. All of this depends on public key infrastructure. And rather than try to go through a bunch of definitions of what that means, let's take a look at a slide that describes it pretty well. I will include a link to this slide so you can take a closer look at it later, but let's just walk through it fairly quickly and make sure that we understand what it's talking about now. The, the key with the hat is the private key in all of these diagrams, and the key with the world on it is the public key. Now, what this is describing is first an email transaction using public key cryptography and then a web page. There have been ways to sign email before, and email really probably should be using this more than it does now. Email signatures and email cryptography have really never taken off. And part of the problem is that what you really need to have happen is the recipient needs to set up their keys, and then the recipient shares their public key with the world. This is kind of similar to the connections we do with SSH, um, but again, those work more, those work in a slightly different way. But the fact that your public key can be viewed by the world. So the first part of this infographic shows how things work with email. And some email clients have had capabilities to encrypt email for a long time, and it's always been possible to encrypt email externally and then paste that encrypted message into the body of the email where it can then be retrieved on the receiving end using the, the private key. So the problem with email encryption is that most people just aren't set up to generate a private key for receiving email because as we'll see, that's how this works. And then sharing a public key to the world that can be used for sending email. So what's happening in this picture is that an email sender is using the recipient's public key to encrypt the, an email message. 
and then sending it along. And then when the person receives it, they receive the encrypted message and they use their private key to open and be able to read it. Now, the sender may also be using keys to identify themselves as long as the recipient has the public key that matches up with the sender's private key. But that's not really a part of how this is all working. The whole point here is that the receiver has generated a private key and shared his public key and the sender can now use that public key to send a message that can only be opened by the receiver. If you stop and think about how this works, it's actually really cool. And again, it's too bad that nobody really uses this. For a website, it works a little bit different. For a website, the private key signs the message before it goes out to the browser. The browser receives it, matches it up with the public key, and then as long as everything matches up, we'll go ahead and open and read it. And everything we talked about before, authentication, data integrity, and encryption are present in this conversation. So let's say now that a hacker has redirected a domain, a website's domain, to his own server, and he tries to do the same thing. The hacker sends out the content encrypted by their private key. When that content reaches the browser, the public key that's expected to work no longer works and indicating that the sender is not valid and not legitimate. That situation right there is what takes care of the authentication portion of this transaction. Data integrity is probably intact and everything is encrypted, but because now we know that the sender can't be trusted, we still don't want to open it because they failed to authenticate themselves. As I mentioned before, for all of this to work, we have to trust those third party certificate authorities. And that trust is usually built into the browser. But why do we trust those things? Jeff Houston is the chief scientist at APNIC, the regional internet registry that serves the Asia Pacific region of the world. In 2008, he wrote a post describing what he had seen in the previous 10 years of the internet. And in June of 2018, he wrote another post indicating this thing that he had seen in the last 10 years. And one of the things that he pointed out is this whole public key certification system and just how untrustworthy it has become. In fact, he says that the systems that we use on the internet are overly trusting to the point of irrational credulity. That's right. Everything that we trust, we probably shouldn't. And, and the proof is in the fact that personal data is constantly breached and leaked, and all that anyone seems to want to do is make regulations harder and more stringent in order to put more penalties on people who are using these bad tools rather than improving the tools. This would be a good time to mention another part of that post uh, where, where Houston talks about the internet of billions of tragically stupid things. As more and more devices come on the internet, and we put them in our homes and we put them in places and we tend to just turn them on and forget about them. We tend to forget that they're all built on other people's software at the lowest possible price. And while it would be nice to think that we've stopped making mistakes in code and that from now on things will be perfect, that is hopelessly idealistic. And so he has some very poignant things to say here, as you can read about the state of the Internet of Things and how naive we are about it. This whole post was really good and had a lot of insight into the last 10 years. And I'll include the link and I highly recommend that you read the whole thing. Now to get to a more specific instance of this breach of trust, let's look at the fall of Semantic. Semantic was once one of the most highly trusted names in PC security. And they were the makers and sellers of some of the best PC security tools on the market. However, a big part of their business in the last few years is to have their own PKI business, their own public key infrastructure business. 
and it operated under a number of pretty well-known brand names. In fact, you may have seen or even purchased certificates under one of the brand names shown here on this page. But in 2017, it was determined that they had done a very sloppy job of checking to make sure that things were valid and were selling certificates without really validating that the buyer was who they said they were. This got so bad that in the summer of 2017, Google announced that they were going to stop accepting any of Symantec's old infrastructure certificates. But it was very fortunate that right around that same time, Symantec actually sold their business to DigiCert. So the plan is still in place in mid-2018, and some of those certificates are already showing up as invalid in Google Chrome, with the rest going to be all marked invalid by October of 2018. And Mozilla Firefox has followed suit and they are also no longer trusting these certificates. Now some independent testing was done and it indicated that about 10% or 100,000 websites of the top million websites as rated by Alexa are affected by this. Now many of those have actually gone through already back in 2017 and reissued new certificates from DigiCert to replace the ones that couldn't be trusted. But there are probably a lot of site owners out there who got hit in April of 2017 and will get hit in October of 2018 and be in a panic mode because they don't understand why their websites are no longer good. At one point, I had certificates from Start SSL, which was one of the first places that offered free SSL certificates. Um, I had my personal websites on certificates by Start SSL. And that was my first encounter with all of this because Start SSL was also determined to be unsafe and their certificates got a revoked status and their CA certificate got revoked out of browsers. And so I went to my own website and it said it wasn't trusted and I had to run around for uh, probably I spent 15 or 20 minutes just trying to figure out if my site was hacked. And eventually I figured out that my certificate wasn't trusted and the problem wasn't with my site at all, but that Start SSL had gotten themselves in trouble and I didn't even know anything about it. So I'm sure that some of those 100,000 sites are going to be in the same boat where they had no clue that their certificates aren't going to be trusted until it happens. As I mentioned at the very beginning, HTTPS is not enough. Target, Home Depot, and Adobe all have sites that use HTTPS, and they've all had major data breaches that exposed identifying information about their users. HTTPS does not mean your data is secure. It just means your connection is secure. So after making sure we are using HTTPS, the next thing we need to do is make sure that our web platforms themselves are secure. Custom web applications should always be written to make sure that they'll avoid blind SQL injection and other common attacks. Rule number one of programming is and always has been this. Never trust user input. If you're using a content management system or other site platform like WordPress, Drupal, or one of the others, security updates are crucial and you should at least review those immediately. I've been using Drupal for over 10 years now and many of the security updates that have come out were mitigated by the fact that you had to have a very specific set of circumstances before the security breach could actually happen. And in some case, they were highly, highly theoretical. However, there were two updates for very, very serious vulnerabilities. The first of which was called Drupal Geddon because over 100,000 sites got hacked in the first weekend as soon as the security release came out and the vulnerability was made public. The Drupal community did a great job early in 2018 of advising people and making sure that they knew that security updates were coming out. And I don't think as many Drupal sites got hit by attacks from that second vulnerability because more people were aware and patched in time. Whenever you configure a content management system, you want to minimize admin access and permissions, not just share admin password with everyone, but give users individual accounts and make sure that only the ones that really should have full administrative permissions do. Taking the extra time to set permissions inside a system helps a lot, especially when you have users who use the same password for everything. 
So if their password gets compromised on a social media site, that same password can't be then used to compromise your website. And lastly, on the web platform side, you can restrict access to sensitive files with the .ht access file or the web config file on IIS. Um, Nginx does not typically honor the .ht access file either, but it's the same type of thing. You can use configuration to protect files that shouldn't be accessed directly from a browser. Um, that can include library files or other things that are used by a website, um, but should not be accessed outside of that website. Server software updates are also very important, especially security updates. And when managing a web server, you should run Windows or Linux updates on a regular basis. Um, it's also a good idea to subscribe to mailing lists or similar feeds to be notified of highly critical updates. There's quite a variety of ways that you can use to limit access to your server. First and foremost, don't run any unnecessary services. This is one of the reasons why I always start with the minimal install out of a Linux operating system. I don't even want packages that I'm not going to use to be installed, let alone running and listening on open ports. The first time I had a Linux server get hacked, it's because I had an unpatched version of a service that I didn't even realize was running on that server. So it's a one-two punch there of not doing updates and not being aware of what services were running on open ports. If services like your database are running locally, then limit that service to only listening on the loopback port when possible. That will also help to make sure that no other outside connections can be made if it's not even listening on your outside addresses. If you are running services on all addresses, then make sure you firewall ports appropriately and only allow connections from trusted sources. Use strong passwords and when possible, two-factor authentication. I've actually seen a system where you can use two-factor auth with SSH and it puts up a little barcode that you can then shoot a picture with your phone and add that to like Google Authenticator, but I have never actually trust, I have never actually tested it out. Um, if you're on Windows, a common thing is to rename the Windows Administrator account to something different and then create another account named Administrator, give it minimalized privileges or no privileges at all and lock that account so it can't be logged in at all. That does a lot to keep hackers from trying to log in as Administrator because your real Administrator account now has a different name. Don't allow remote Linux root user access. Now you're going to say, wait. I've set up this class and we've started using root from the beginning. Yes, but there are ways to make that much more secure than having wide open access where root can just log in with a password, possibly even a weak password. And remove inactive users. That's actually true for both your website and for your operating system. If you have user accounts that aren't being used, the best way to keep someone from hacking them is to simply remove them. If you're going to use remote root, you really should set it up to use SSH key based authentication only. And you can make a change in your SSH config file that says permit root login without password, which means that if you're on the local console, root can still log in with a password, but they must use a key or some other mechanism that isn't a password to authenticate. And then if you have multiple users who all have keys logging in as root, set your log level to verbose and anytime a user logs in over SSH, it will log which public key was used to authenticate that user. That's another way to track down which administrator performed a certain task at a certain time, or at least you'll know which administrator or administrators were logged in at the time that something happened if you ever need to go back and look into that. Another thing you can do is review your logs regularly. Most web applications log some to the database and you can review those logs for errors or other problems and review your system logs for errors or attempted or even successful security breaches. I've included the directories here for Windows and Linux logs that you would wanna look at. And in Windows, you also wanna open up and look at the event viewer 
because the event viewer will show all kinds of logs and show errors from applications, errors from the system, and authentication errors, uh, just to name a few of the things that it does. My driver's ed instructor told me that an accident always has at least two causes. If you look at any vehicular traffic accident, you should be able to identify at least two things that went wrong. The same is true with software vulnerabilities. Most of them are more highly exploitable when at least one other thing is insecure. Um, a great example of this is improper file permissions and allowing uploadable files. Uh, improper file permissions on a directory like 777 and then a web server script that allows you to upload files and doesn't check the file extensions and limit them to only certain kinds of files. So the next thing you know, someone writes a PHP script to go sniff around your server and they can upload that to your upload directory. And if your upload directory is in your website, then they can call and run that PHP script that they just uploaded, poke around your server and find other things wrong. Now, if everything else is locked down perfectly on your server, that hacker is going to find out things about your server, but they're not going to find a way in. However, as soon as they find any weakness that they can exploit, uh, usually has to do with the temporary directory and being, being able to force a file into that directory, they can then use their uploaded script and perhaps files in a temporary directory or some other means, some other vulnerability that they can use then to hack your site and get in. Another problem is if they can upload a PHP script and then discover your database credentials, then they can use their script to go right to your users table and either retrieve or change the administrator password in your database. And then they can log into your site as administrator and go. So again, it was always a multiple of things. And most vulnerabilities are like this. A vulnerability by itself isn't going to be as big of an exploit as when it provides a toehold to get in and attack the system from a second way. I've provided some links for additional reading here. Most of these things are the things that I have quoted and talked about uh, putting this together. The Drupal security tips, which is the last one there, has some tips that are generic enough that they're not Drupal specific and there's something to consider no matter what system you're using. So that's a good post as well. As always, thanks for watching. And please be sure to let your instructor know if you have any questions about this or any of the other videos.